Welcome to day 26 of Understanding Financial Accounting. We're moving right along. We're down to the last five of your 30-day dental MBA. Let's keep doing a little review from last tape. I do this because I, I want you to do the whole program. I don't want you to take bits and pieces. Finishing up on legal and ethical. ADRA means advantages, disadvantages, risk and alternatives. Chart it every time. Make it a habit. It's operation logistics. It goes back to even the tape before that, tape 24. Operation logistics, ADRA, every time you sit down. NCMH, no change in medical history. You cannot sit there. There are girls suing because they're pregnant, because you gave them this antibiotic and it, it, it inactivate their birth control, and you say you told them, and it's a year later and you're in court, you want to control today. Forget about yesterday. Whoever controls today controls history. You know, history is controlled by whoever's writing history. When you're sitting there in court and it says NCMH, you won't even be in court. You know why? Because a lawyer who's going to take this woman's case is looking at the charge and saying, how do I defend this in front of a jury of 12? The only reason I haven't gone before the board, the lawsuits, been sued, the only reason I haven't been drug fast is because Locke, Jeffrey Tonner, who writes his book, What They Don't Teach You in Dental School, Dental Malpractice by Jeffrey J. Tonner, J.D. He's the national guru of this stuff. Get his book. It's in Penwell Communications, which owns Dental Economics. He says all the time, doctors, you don't have the money to cancel a day's patients you know, higher legal fees, go down there, be all upset. This is all you'll focus on for a month. Going to court is like going to war. Nobody wins. You want to get rid of this stuff? Redo bad work or work that didn't turn out right. Don't look at it as judgmental. Get your ego out of the gosh darn room. If you're a human, you're having frailties. If you're a human, you're a sinner. If you're a human, you make mistakes. When you learn how to walk, you fell down. Damn it, if it doesn't work out, redo it. And, and chalk it off as continuing education. Why will you not redo a denture or a crown, but you go pay $2,000 to go sit in the Panky Institute for a week? Come on. Real continuing education is redoing your fillings. I don't learn jack crap for when I sit down and do a filling and it comes out perfectly. Every time I get up out of the room and say, man, that was perfect, I learn nothing. All I'm doing is just, just doing it. I learn everything I learn from going in there and say, why did this not work? Why is this biting me? Don't get your ego involved. You learn more when you're the Chicago Bulls. You learn more from getting your butt kicked by the Lakers or the New York Knicks. You learn more about basketball and losing to the Knicks by two points than you ever do by beating the Suns or beating some other team by 100 points. Pay another dentist to redo the work. I don't like sending them to your friend because you send them to your friend for ego needs. Ask a patient, say, I'll tell you what, you go find another dentist, I'll redo the work. You know, if you don't know one, these are two really good guys I recommend. Give them two, so the choice there is give them three, give them a short list, uh, someone close, someone you know. Maybe you can work it out with another team. What I like to do is when a patient comes to me really, really upset, and some dentist did something, the very poor outcome, and they're really upset and they're telling me they want to sue. I tell them this. I love doing this. I say, well, I'll tell you what. Are, are you really going to sue? I've had this happen. I have this happen about once every two years. A lady comes in. I want you to redo this. I'm taking the bill. I'm going to sue this doctor, yada, yada, yada. And I sit down. And I say, look, um, you know, um, I'm a human. Are you? Uh, I made mistakes of you. I'm a sinner. Are you? Come on. You love the sinner. You hate the sin. I'll tell you what. I will redo this free of charge if you sign right here in the chart. You will not take this dentist to the board. You will not sue him, yada, yada, yada. I'll redo this crown, root canal, denture, partial, whatever. And then when it's all done, I mail the chart. And I mail the deal to the dentist um, across the street or down the block, whatever. So what's happened in the last 12 years? You sit there. The biggest way to get someone to do something for you is you give them a gift first. If they're high self-esteem functional, they always have to return the gift. And then you sit there, and, uh, and I love it. I mean, I, I was dropping out of this late school the other day, and this uh, friend of mine, this woman that's walking up, and she says, hey, hey, I think you owe me now. So-and-so came in, man. You did a crown. She's packing food. She thought you were a bozo, yada, yada, yada. And I got the bite wing right in my purse. And I'm laughing, and she's laughing, and we're high-fiving. That's what sort of professional sovereign poverty, camaraderie is all about. Not, you know, inner white male fraternity, good old boy club that doesn't extend personal liberties to you. Start building sovereign professional relationships. Make it a New Year's resolution 
And before the year is over, you will have every you will have lunch one time with every dentist within three miles of your office. And uh, you know, I had a dentist the other day. You know, I always do this stuff. A new dentist moved to the neighborhood about six months ago, and uh, I've been making a point to go there. There's Ironwood Dentistry, and uh, gosh, I was walking out the car the other day, and there he was getting out of the car and walking around with a buddy and other friends of the dentist. And he said, hey, what are you doing? And I mean, it, was just, it just feels great that, you know, here's another bald dentist in the same neighborhood, just moved in, and he's high self-esteem, and he's out meeting the neighborhood, and he's out meeting other dentists. That's fun stuff. Come on, you got more in common with the dentist across the street than you do with 99% of your village. Why do you not have a relationship with these guys? And last but not least, refund the money. Come on, Walmart takes back about 1% of all of its sales. I go in every dental office that sit there and collected three hundred thousand last year. And I said, "Well, did you refund three thousand dollars last year?" No. Well, how come Sam Walton died with twenty-nine billion dollars and he did and you didn't? There's nothing wrong with refunding the money. It just means that your ego's checked. It means you're human. It means you need to take more continuing ed. It means that dentistry is a moving target, and to stay on top of this game takes you know a hundred, two hundred, three hundred hours of continuing ed a year. Um, spend an extra five minutes charting. Uh, bad or unanticipated results. What happened? Why did it occur, if known? What future op op options were given to the patient? Hey, if you broke a file, first of all, before every root canal from an operational logistics point of view, our dental assistants will go in there before the doctor even is in the room. We play them a five minute tape by G. John Schofield, Dentistry 2000, Dana Point, California. And they'll sit there and say, here's a root canal. And explains how the root canal is done. That's meaningful to a lot of patients in a minute or two of graphics. And it says, you know from uh, driving a race car, driving a car, that whenever you have moving parts, sometimes things break. Sometimes the file breaks. And you know, a root canal is not a cure. It's a therapy with an extremely high success rate. But you know, one in 20 fail. And if they fail, here's what we need to do. We need to redo it. We might need to lay a flap and go do an apicoectomy, cut off the bottom, a retrofill, whatever. Explains the whole thing, three to four minutes with graphics. G. John Schofield spent, I know he spent about 50 grand developing this thing. And uh, Gordon Christian spent $50,000 on, uh, on um, building one hour-long um, patient education tape. You got all these patient education tapes. Play them before the procedure stops. Uh, starts and uh, or maybe you numb them, numb them up. You gotta let it soak in for five minutes. Playing that tape while the hygienist or the assistant setting up the room, developing the X-rays, whatever. Get everything down to a system prepared. For, uh, number one, as soon as you get the system down, not only do you run smoother, but then you'll be ready to bring in an associateship to practice like you do under your umbrella, and it's, you'll start forming your exit strategy. People are naturally good. Learning, creativity, fairness, responsibility, and justice come naturally to people, according to Abraham Maslow, the genius. Maslow wrote the best book on management because he was the smartest people person there was. Why is it that we often design organizations as if people naturally shirk responsibility, the only what is required, resist learning, can't be trusted to do the right thing? Why has society gone from, gosh darn, Kitty Hawk to, to Neil Armstrong landing on the moon in about 66 years, when everybody thinks everyone's evil. A lot of that comes from mass media and media selling newspapers hype. For instance, you got a quarter of a billion people in America. Okay, well it takes about a quarter of a billion people before one Jeffrey Dahmer starts attacking joggers, raping them, and eating them. You need a quarter of a billion people for that to happen. That is not something that routinely happens on your block. How many male joggers do you know get uh, attacked, homosexually raped, and eaten on your block? Okay, it happened one time, but everybody sits around watching it, and then everybody runs their door and locks it, okay? There's only one Jeffrey Dahmer for every quarter of a billion people. And um, Abraham Aslow said that for centuries, human nature has been sold short. People are not evil. They're more times sick. People aren't evil or unethical. They're usually uneducated and dumb. I was talking to a good friend of mine who um, is in the Superior Court here, and he, uh, he's an MBA, fellow MBA, uh, kind of runs the law Superior Court. I said, well, what, what, what's the profile of your typical person in prison? Uneducated, on drugs. Uneducated, on drugs. All the prisons, if you didn't graduate from the eighth grade, you are 14 times more likely to go to prison than if you finished high school. Who lives below the poverty line? They didn't finish the 12th grade. They got married before their 20. They had a kid out of wedlock. It's not evil, immoral, unethical people. It's simply the poor, the poverty, the uneducated, the illiterate, making low quality decisions. So don't sell out human nature. Remember, report a lawsuit immediately to your carrier. Most of you guys have dental malpractice. You haven't even read it. Of all the litigation procedures applicable to you, 
One is more important than all the others. Telephone your malpractice carrier the very day you're served. Not the next day or when it's convenient, but the very day. This is important in avoiding a default. Default judgments, a defendant cannot forestall the legal process by ignoring a complaint. If you are tardy, the plaintiff's counsel can move for an entry default. A lot of people, they, they get a default and their staff, is, they, they don't believe in the office manager. They don't allow their hygienist to talk. Um, it's a very low self-esteem dentist who thinks if you want something done right, do it yourself. Goes on vacations for two weeks and they serve papers or they got a, a, uh, a uh, something someone had to sign for in the mail. Then you get back, you're stressed, you think about it for a week or two. Next thing you know, you lost, default. And your dental malpractice isn't going to cover it because read the fine print. They have to be notified the day you find out. The four possible outcomes of a civil trial trial. The plaintiff can dismiss the lawsuit, very rare, termination by direct verdict, settlement, or jury verdict, okay? Those are the only four things that can happen. Uh, don't get all freaked out by a lawsuit. Main thing is how do you select an attorney? Most dentists are very ego deficient, and they go to their buddy who's a friend of theirs who golfs with, who does uh, uh, maybe probate, wills, and estates. So they'll choose that guy as an attorney. Come on, would you, would you let... Would you let an oncologist do a root canal on you? Would you let Dr. DeBakey, the greatest heart doctor, cardiovascular surgeon ever lived, do a filling on your tooth? I wouldn't let him get within 100 feet of my teeth. How many civil, not criminal cases, has a lawyer tried? How many has he tried to a jury as opposed to the bench? How many cases has he or she tried himself or herself as opposed to the second chair situation where he was just involved? How many cases involved health-related, let alone dental-related malpractice. And how many of these were tried to a conclusion? My gosh, if you want the best root canal done in the world, you ought to go to Brad Gettleman or Kit Weathers or Patrick Wall or G. John Schofel or, or uh, Ben Johnson or John McSpadden. You wouldn't sit there and go to someone at freshman year dental school who says they're interested in doing root canals. If you get the best attorney, you're going to win. That's why the Fortune 500 is so successful because they got big bucks, they got big in-house laws that specialize in stuff. They go to the best firms, and then you go pick the solo practitioner idiot who's never done this case, and these Fortune 500 companies eat you alive. The standard of care is always talked about, but I don't think dentists realize that the standard of care is to meet the minimum standards. The standard of care is not an A+. It's not even a B. It's the lowest passing score. C minus dentistry and above satisfies the standard of care. What do juries like? In speaking with juries after the trial, Jeffrey Tonner has always found that they most embrace the expert who possesses two qualities, personal appeal and the ability to explain concepts in simple English. You're always going to your malpractice care and go, oh, I went to the University of Hillbilly Hill and my, my chairman of the department, he wrote the book in mitochondria and I want him. Yeah, he's a geek, he's an idiot, he has no personal appeal, he's got a beard, a mustache, a bone through his nose, no one knows a damn word he's saying. Then the people suing you get some tall, dark, and handsome person, I guarantee you no one will ever ask me to be an expert witness. They want the Ronald Reagan, tall, dark, and handsome, good-looking person, explains in English, is always smiling, always looking at the jury, maintains eye contact. You need to swoosh these people. Great dentists often make poor expert witnesses. If you've never been asked to be an expert witness, you're probably a great dentist. You probably know everything you know what you're talking about, but you explain it 5,200 words of Latin and Greek, and you'll never be in a Calvin Klein commercial. Natural, the National Practitioner Data Bank uh, was created by Congress in 1992 as a confidential clearinghouse for negative information concerning healthcare practitioners. If you settle a matter privately with the patient and the individual uh, and with a patient and individually pay a sum, the NP, the National Practitioners Data Bank, is not involved. So whenever you settle, Doctor Ego, none of this, all this stuff's um, under the, the radar screen. Okay, when your ego says I ain't taking it to court, remember the funniest thing a judge says. If you ever ask a judge and you say, "What's the hands down the dumbest thing you ever hear in law?" He says. When a lawyer comes up and says, I got a slam dunk case. Hell, the OJ case was slam dunk, and the jury let him out in four minutes. And now he's out there spending the rest of his life looking for his wife's killer, 
and uh, on a golf course because hell he, he knows where the killer is um we know we know that basically when, when you're in front of a jury of 12 you are flipping a coin buddy um you don't know how these people think abandonment is a very bad deal in dentistry three factors must be considered before discharging a patient other than for non-payment no dental work pending no emergencies and you release the chart okay state boards frown massively on patient abandonment. Make sure there's no dental work pending, they're not having an emergency, you release the chart. What do I mean by release the chart? Under most state laws, the dentist owns a chart, but the patient controls its distribution. You know, you say, well, these are my x-rays, uh, they're mine. Well, the patient paid for them. You own the chart, you own the x-rays, but the patient controls its distribution. When a patient demands a copy, follow these steps. Insist on a written release, that's an obvious, that's a great one, and retain the originals. They're called evidence. Whenever you're doing a business deal, you're doing a case presentation, or you're in a lawsuit, the continuum for debating with these people is very simple. You can negotiate. You can negotiate, that's where just two people negotiate. You can mediate. What's a mediate? Well, you, your two kids are fighting, you say, come here, Eric, Greg, listen, now. Let, let's talk this out. I'm a mediator. I'm just, I'm just trying to clarify. You're talking, he's not understanding what you're saying. Did you understand what he just said? I'm a mediator. There's no force or coercion involved. Or are we arbitrating? An arbitrator is where we go in and two people are going to mediate, but the arbitrator is going to put in some rules. A lot of times it's binding arbitration. In fact, a lot of people are getting very smart and they're writing on the chart. If there is ever a problem, we both agree in contract. And all contracts are enforceable unless the contract is asking us to agree to something that is illegal. If we are, if we are signing a contract, agreeing to do something that is not illegal, it is binding. It is legally binding. You can write on a chart that says, if we have a problem, if we have a dispute resolution, you sign right here, I sign right here, that this will be solved by binding arbitration. We will call the National Association of Arbitrators or the State Association of Arbitrators. Usually they're retired judges, retired lawyers, whatever. And we will go there without judges and lawyers and all this stuff. We'll both present our case. Whatever the arbitrator says goes. It's not a record. It's not a National Practitioner Data Bank. It's not a court filed record. It's a personal matter. Or you can use maximum force and coercion and have the least control. And you go to litigate and you're turning everything over to a judge, statutes, and the interpretation of a jury. And remember one thing about jury. Every smart person there is in the United States, when served jury notice, gets out of it. Remember, everyone who serves on a jury doesn't have a job, they're uneducated, they hate their job so much, they, they're getting out of work, they're retired, they're bored, they can't think of anything to do, and they literally think it might be exciting. This is the most excitement they got. They're going to go sit on a jury. You're dealing with the gosh darn bottom of the food chain here. You're putting your life in their hands. That's why 95, 97, some say 98% of all lawsuits never make it to court because lawyers want control for their clients. While I'm negotiating with you, I've got control. Anything we agree to, I had an option. Same with mediation. Now, binding arbitration, at least you're not dealing with the gosh darn jury. At least you know that the American Association of Arbitrators is going to be dealing with a judge or a lawyer or someone incredibly trained. This guy here, this arbitrator here in binding arbitration, on the aggregate, is about 47,000 times smarter than the average person sitting on a jury, okay? Uh, most of them uh, couldn't shoot themselves in the head if you gave them a loaded gum. I mean, it's just, I mean, come on, think about it. Look at yourself. Have you ever served on a jury? Think about it. Ask yourself that. I'll never forget when uh, my son asked mom, um, why does dad have to stay at work so late? And mom replies, so we can get all his work done. I came home that night and Ryan comes up to me and says, dad, if it takes you so long to get your work done, why don't you ask your teacher to put you in a slower group? And uh, this comes down to work smarter, not harder. Don't spend time in lawsuits. Don't spend time in this stuff. Approach avoidance is from the negative emotions that you already have regarding a subject that keeps you from approaching that subject. How come you took calculus one, calculus two, calculus three, physics, inorganic, organic, biology, microbiology, physiology, anatomy, Krebs cycle, periodic table? How come you can tell me how many solar systems there are? How come you can tell me light travels 186,000 miles a second, 5.8 trillion miles in a year, and you can't tell me what your damn overhead is? How come you can't tell me uh, 
How come you can't tell me how many new patients you get or, or what was your return on investment of 1-800-DENTIST versus the yellow pages? See, you avoid this stuff for emotional reasons. Obviously, when you were little, um, something got tagged. I think most people get tagged with money because they hear their parents fighting about money. And I hear the mom come, you know, the mom comes in there and says, well, how come you didn't tell me that you took $300 out of the ATM machine? And your dad walks home and says, who left all these damn lights on? Why is the front door open? What do you think? We're born in a barn. Do you know what the light bill was in this house? My God, the light bill. Ah. And the kids are all sitting there like, oh my God, money is so stressful and we don't have enough. And gosh darn it, why are you stepping in muddy water? I just bought you a brand new pair of tennis shoes. Look what you did. Quit being stupid. Ah. So people are so emotionally charged against money. They stay away from the subject. You know, if your mom and dad, if your dad beat up your mom, you're like 15 times more likely to hit your wife. Okay. All behavior is learned. Okay. When you see your mom and dad fighting about money, um, you ran off to professional school to be a doctor, dentist, or lawyer, eight years of college. They didn't teach you how to make payroll. They didn't tell you what a 1040 was. When you left eight years of a formal education, you were uh, in the world of free enterprise, you're illiterate. I mean, someone who'd been running a Chinese restaurant for a year that doesn't speak English runs circles around you, and you never want to climb the mountain of finance and slay the dragons and do what it takes to reach success because in your formative years, money is a very negative subject. It's very emotional. Hell, go to church and they say things like, it's easier to get to heaven. Uh, it's harder for a rich man to get to heaven than it is for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. You're like, oh, I know. Money's bad. Money's evil. Ignorance is evil. Okay. Approach avoidance is bad. Tony Robbins said, if you snooze, you lose. Makes me not want to sleep. You got to climb the mountains and slay the dragons and win the war. The limitations of accounting systems are massive, according to Maslow and management. Um, he says, I'm going to dictate sometime soon my thoughts on how stupid our present accounting systems are because they leave out practically all the important personal, psychological, political, educational um, intangibles. We talked earlier, the accounting system starts, you know, it was designed in 1929, stock market crashed, um, everybody's cooking the books. The stock market crashed because um, the government cut off um, immigration about 10 years earlier and it took about 10 years of stopping the immigrants who would come in and work cheap keep expenses down and then work hard and buy houses and buy cars and buy boats and planes and trains they cut off long-term aggregate growth uh, so labor unions could make more money for doing less which basically if you support the labor unions you're just supporting grandma and grandpa paying higher prices finally it caught up with long-term aggregate demand by 1929 we crashed and when we crashed a lot of Wall Street, uh, everybody had a different yardstick. And everybody was, you know, saying, well, these are my honest books, but no one agreed on yardsticks. Like we got practice management speakers saying that they have 50% overhead, but they don't, have, they don't, they don't factor in that uh, cost of capital or the opportunity cost of the dental service versus the profit of the business. Everybody has a different yardstick. And if we're going to do financial accounting right, we got to go to the financial accounting standards boards and agree on some definitions. This is where financial accounting started. It started in 1929 with the Security Exchange Commission when they were called to come in and lay down the rules for how Wall Street reports your books, okay? We talked about this. There's eight or nine publicly traded dental companies uh, that you need to be getting their 10K annual reports. You need to get incorporated for liability purposes, especially, you know, if you pay off your house, you pay off your practice, and you get a half million dollars or a million dollars in your 401K, and then your 21-year-old comes out of a bar in college and runs over a little old lady, you're running naked. Uh, your malpractice isn't going to come in, come in and carry cover your 21-year-old boy. Uh, they were also used by the IRS for outside tax collectors, okay? Well, all that stuff has little to help you run your business. Um, that's why the other end of the accounting structure is managerial accounting, where you start managing things that manage your activity. Activity-based costing equals activity-based management. Um, like Abraham Maslow said, um, the important things, the personnel, personal, psychological. Um, are we monitoring staff turnover? Do we have a goal for staff turnover? If our goal is that the average staff member stays here four years, then why are we hiring Megan, who only moved to the city because her husband's in the Marines, and the Marines already have plans with this guy in, in two years to go somewhere else? We don't want Megan. We want people born in her backyard. We tell our people, well, you know, our goal is that our staff's going to stay with us four years. Um, do you think that'll be a problem? 
They'll even tell you, well, you know, actually, uh, we're trying to get pregnant. And if I do get pregnant and have the baby, I'm moving back to Bumblebutt so my mom and sisters can help me take care of it. Um, what about continuing education? You got an associate in there. You got a hygienist in there. Do you have an educational requirement? Um, you come work at today's dental, and we tell you you got five years to get your FAGD. You have to get 100 hours to see a year, then pass an all-day exam. And then after that, you got five more years to get your MAGD. And uh, what, what's the rule on that continuing education? How much, you know, I'm not going to pay for the whole thing. Because then you have no incentive to control costs. You'll just likely pick a course in Maui as one up the street or one done on a Gordon Christian PCC educational video. So you got to start measuring things other than just assets equal uh, um, liabilities minus equity. What is the difference between your profession and your business? There's a big difference. What is your business? People say, oh, I'm a banker. Then I ask them, uh, uh, or they say, uh, I own the bank. And they usually respond, uh, people say, I'm a banker. You say, well, do you own the bank? They say, no, I work there. So they confuse their profession with their business. And that is, since they have confused their profession with their business. Their profession may be a banker or a dentist, but they still need their own income-producing assets. Ray Kroc was clear on the difference between his profession and his business. His profession was always the same. He was a salesman. At one time, he sold mixtures for milkshakes. Soon thereafter, he was selling hamburger franchise. And while his profession was selling hamburger franchise, his business was the accumulation of income-producing real estate. Yours should be IRAs, a 401k, debt-free lifestyle, whatever, but everybody needs to know their business. A problem with school is that you often become what you study. So if you study, say, cooking, you become a chef. You study law, you become a lawyer. If you study dentistry, you become a dentist. The mistake in becoming what you study is that too many people forget to mind their own business and live on their investment income only. They spend their lives working hard and making someone else rich by spending all their money. A corporation is merely a legal document that creates a legal body without a soul. It's paper. I just absolutely laugh my brains out when the Democrats saying that they should got to raise corporate tax. Who is corporate tax? We'll raise tax a billion dollars and you lay off all the Democrats who voted for you. If, if, they, if you tax them a billion dollars and they keep their workers, or they have to raise the price of their cars all Democrats have to buy. Why don't the Democrats tell the truth and say, hey, buddy, we've already confiscated half your paycheck. Now we're going to steal more money from you by making everything you buy cost more. And then we're going to print more money with inflation. And we're going to steal money out of your checking account through inflation. The three types of scores used by accountants are the balance sheet, and a balance sheet means something balances. Your asset, your home, balances with, equals to, the liability debt you owe on your house versus the equity you have into it. And the statement of income, also known as the profit and loss statement, or the P&L. That's basically your, your, um, how you're doing in this increment of time. For the month, this is our score. Uh, statement of cash flow, that's basically your check register, okay? You have your deposits, you write your bills, how much cash? The income statement may say that for the month of February, we netted $10,000. But your check register says that you're under $10,000. Well, which, what are you going to look at? I mean, I have more dentists come me. Their statement of income says, well, it says we made $10,000. Then my God dang wife say we don't have a dime. Well, you got three scores. You got your balance sheet. You got your statement of income. That's your performance review for a time period, usually a month. And you got your cash flow that says, hey, you might be making money, but uh, you uh, ran out of cash. Number three, statement of cash flow is the number one reason people go bankrupt. 80 to 90% of the small businesses that go out of business were profitable on their statement of income and were doing pretty good with their leverage or balance sheet. They just flip and ran out of cash, okay? Um, the three types of assets some people say are hardware, uh, like uh, land, building, equipment, build out, plumbing, electrical phones, um, software. Uh, which is your computer management information system like SoftDent, Practice Outlook, Shine, EagleSoft, Microsoft Money, Quicken, Peachtree. But most of the assets now that we've left the Industrial Revolution where hardware, bricks and mortar and steel mills were king, now we've left that behind and now all, all people agree that right now the number one asset is, doesn't even show up on a balance sheet. It's your wetware. What do you know? What's your experience? What's your education? You got your FAGD, your MAGD? You got your diplomat in Congress or on Pontology? Have you gone all the way through the Pink Institute? Uh, if you're into practice management, why don't you go back and get your MBA? How much continued do you take? How many consultants have you come in to actually audit you? You know, the Fortune 500, they by law 
have to have big six accounting firms come in and check their books just so the SEC knows that what they're reporting is true. When's the last time you had enough self-esteem to put yourself in an aquarium, which I've lived in from day one, and have Sally McKenzie come in your office and poke around in it? Or, uh, or take your books to uh, Mike Schuster's Institute here in Scottsdale, or Jim Pride's Institute, or have Kathy Jameson come in your deal, or Linda Miles, or Jennifer D. St. George. AFCO, actually, I think, has... Um, has some of the best consultants. They have a hundred consultants in the field, and 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 the reason you don't hear much about them, because all the other consultants combined, in my opinion, since they opened their doors to date, all the other consultants combined have not done what AFCO did. AFCO has done a billion dollars. When you're doing a billion dollars, you don't have to run around putting out flyers. But AFCO has a hundred field consultants in the field. Um, get newsletters. Subscribe to my friend report. Come on. 602-598-0001. Um, the Ferrari Report, if you want to know what is the unique selling proposition of that, that is, you know, we're 48 pages a month, no advertising. I read Forbes, Fortune Time, Inc., The Economist. I'm on the internet. We got all these search engines. When I find dentistry in The Economist, I know you don't read The Economist, the Ferrari Report is like the Reader's Digest. The Reader's Digest doesn't write 99% of all the articles that have ever been published in Reader's Digest. It's a clearinghouse for great articles that have been published somewhere else. So when you get an article published in dentistry in Forbes or Fortune or Inc. or Success or Time or Newsweek, and with search engines today, uh, we, we, we find re, um, dentistry in the news from Rio de Janeiro to Japan to Singapore to Hong Kong. So all the Ferrari Report is, it's a little bit of me, uh, maybe four or five pages and some questions and answers. People send in questions that I think are relevant to other people. And then a lot of reprints from The Economist, The Wall Street Journal, The Times, Newsweek. Um, Go back and get your MBA. Get your Master's in Public Health. Go through the Mint Institute. Go through Dickerson's LVI. Go through Ross Nash and Deborah Engerhart's. Go through Larry Rosenthal's. Go through Hornbrook and uh, Dorfman's. Get your wetware. That's your asset. And when you develop that thing up real big, it'll never even show up on your balance sheet. So we talked about the balance sheet. There's a really neat guy, Robert, Robert Kioski and Sharon Lecter, a CPA. Robert Kioski grew up in uh, Hawaii. Now he's retired out here. He lives right by um, Harvey McKay in Paradise uh, uh, Valley here where Omar Reed is. About a mile or two from this studio. And he says the reason the rich get richer and the poor get poor and the middle class struggle in debt is because the subject of money is taught at home, not in the school. Most of us learn about money from our parents. So what can a poor parent tell their child about money? In fact, think about it. The first major bank ever set up was by the Rothschilds. And you know, for the following 100 years, like 90% of all the banks were set up by Rothschild's children, uh, who they married, their cousins, nephews. Because where do you go learn about banking if it's not in the books, if it's not in your school? Okay, knowledge is transferred by families. The number one determinant variable on determining your kid's success is where they were born, I don't care how smart they are, if they're born in Bangladesh, Tanzania, Tanzania, Alberia, Albania, or uh, Calcutta, India, uh, chances are they're going to be an uneducated peasant and die of uh, cholera. Um, number one determinant is geographical time and place where they're born. Number two is whose hut are they born into. If you're born into a hut where mom and dad are there, and mom and dad have all these success habits, those success habits will probably be learned by their children. You must know the difference between an asset and a liability and then buy assets. If you want to be rich, this is all you need to know. Rule number one, it's the only rule. Rich people acquire assets. The poor and the middle class acquire liabilities and then they think they're assets. Here's a balance sheet, or here, here's the top of p and You got your income coming in, your expense, and then the bottom here is your balance sheet where your assets equal your liabilities plus equity, okay? Now look at the upper class and middle class look at this differently. Okay, a middle class person they have their job, income comes in, here they are, they have their job, they work, they get income, the government confiscates half their money, okay? After the government confiscates half their money, because remember, if you collected your own money and spent it yourself, that'd be efficient. You collect your own money and spend it on someone else, it'd be less efficient. You collect, your own, you collect someone else's money and spend it on you, now you're being a little frivolous and very inefficient, but if you collect other people's money and spend on other people, it's a complete waste. Ask Gosh R. Milton Friedman, Nobel Prize winning economist. But that's how our system works right now. The poor people, they in the middle class, they have a job. 
Uh, the government, mainly Al Gore and all of his counterparts, the Democratic Party, steals half their paycheck. Then they take what's left and they go dump it into liabilities. They go dump it into a mortgage, a car payments. So the government takes half and then they finance their home. The average mortgage in the United States is a 30 year loan. And any loan over 24 years is called interest only. These guys are so freaking stupid. They buy their house the first six years. Say you bought a $100,000 home, 10% interest, $1,000 a month payment. The first six years, they pay $950 a month interest, $50 principals. Hell, they'd been a lot better off to go stay at the Motel 6. At least they wouldn't have to make their own damn bed. And uh, so money comes in, money goes out in taxes, money goes out in liabilities. And that's their cash flow pattern, okay? And then they're stuck in a rut their whole life. Okay, there it is. And, and as soon as they get, and they're always trying to get more debt. In fact, you give a middle class person $50, first thing he uses it for is a down payment on a loan to get into a motorcycle or jet ski. And then when he's, when he's locked up in mortgages and car payments, consumer loans, then he sits there and maxes out his credit cards. Did you know dentistry is a $47 billion a year industry? And last year, Americans spent $50 billion just on interest on master charge and visa these people spend the entire dental industry on interest only and in 1950 we didn't even have credit cards so 1950 credit cards were zero interest on credit cards were zero and last year it was more money for the last five years every year for the last five years americans spent more money in interest on their credit cards than they do on dentistry so then what happens as as the middle class as their incomes go up their expenses go up and their liabilities go up. So if you if they're getting paid ten thousand dollars a year, uh, they'll sit there and they'll buy a ten thousand dollar Ford Escort. If you give them a raise of twenty thousand dollars a year, they'll buy a twenty thousand dollar Ford Taurus. You give them thirty thousand dollars a year, they get an Oldsmobile. You give them forty thousand dollars a year, they get a Gosher and Buick. You give them fifty thousand dollars a year, they buy a Cadillac. If they're making fifty thousand dollars a year, they have a fifty thousand dollar home. You give them a raise to a hundred thousand, they get a hundred thousand dollar home. You know who's the worst in that disease? Doctors, dentists, and lawyers. You know why? Because when you're a school teacher, you say, well, hell, I'm a school teacher. School teachers don't make any money. I'll go buy this nice, modest house. But you come out of school and say, well, I'm a, I'm a doctor. I'm a dentist, and I'm a lawyer, and I know we make big bucks. So I've got to get me a Rolex watch, and I've got to get me a Mercedes Benz, and I'm going to get me a big house and a big spouse, and I'm going to sit there and be a slave your whole life. So the middle class struggles, no matter how much income you give them, all they do is move their liabilities up to the next market segmentation to match their income. They do this their whole life and they retire with nothing. More money will often not solve our problems. In fact, it may actually accelerate the problems. It turns a problem Doberman Pinscher into a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Money often makes obvious our tragic human flaws. Money often puts a spotlight on what we don't know. Okay, now, how do, how do wealthy people think? Wealthy people believe their home is a liability. They will, if you give them a balance sheet, they'll say, yeah, your home goes right there. Poor people, uh, they think their home's an asset. See, wealthy people think assets pay them out money. They know the home sucks money out like a vacuum cleaner. And when we got married, my wife went to design a house and she said, well, honey, do you want some input? And I said, yeah. I said, okay, here's a big screen. Here's your refrigerator. Here's my chair. And here's you laying butt naked in a bed. Uh, I think we need about 100 square feet. Comes back, it's 5,000 square foot. I've never, I go upstairs about every one time a year in our house. We, and she went on a golf course. She's never played golf once in her life. And I played golf on the, on the golf course one time. It was when Rick Kirshner came into town. So I've golfed on the golf course one time. She's never golfed. You know what she's doing now? She just bought the pad next door to us. And she's going to put on a tennis court. I've been married to her 12 years. She doesn't even own a racket. She's never played tennis one time. But that's how people think especially if they grew up in a trailer. And uh, what, do, what do the masses, or uh, basically, um, if you do what the masses do, you get the following picture. You work for a paycheck, you give half to the government, and you give the rest to the bank, and you don't buy any assets. You don't fund your IRA, you don't fund your 401k, uh, you, just, you just don't have anything. What do the rich do? The rich have incomes, they pay out their taxes, then what they do is they buy assets, stocks, bonds, real estate, whatever property and these assets you put a dollar in I don't care if it's a CD at the end of the year that CD might be worth a dollar and a nickel well what happens now that nickel comes back up into income so then what do they do they're always buying assets so you take a dollar of income I pay say say two dollars dollar expense you got a dollar asset at the end of the year and now it's a dollar ten 
Well, now that 10 goes back up in income, this 10 filters down, and it starts forming a circle. This is why the rich get richer. I mean, the more money they make, the more assets they buy, they still have the money they make, and the assets are making money. My dad never called a dollar bill a dollar bill. He said every dollar bill is an employee. Not only will it work for you. Can I have another copy, Sam? My dad said it's not a dollar bill. People call it a dollar bill, then they go trade it in for something. A dollar bill is an employee. It'll work for you. It'll work for you years after you die. Look at these trust funds. Look at the Rockefeller Trust Fund and Johnson Johnson Trust Fund. Johnson Johnson are dead. Their trust fund's still working for them. He said, if I give you $100, you have 100 employees. Each gosh darn dollar bill will make you a dime every year the rest of your life. What do you poor people do? You give them a dollar, they throw it to the first person they see. They say, oh, here, here, Big Mac. Uh, here, here, French fries. Here, jet ski. All they do is take all the people that will work for them the rest of their life, and they give them away, and then they go back to work, and they go to work, and they say, well, I don't work for money. But that's like, well, obviously, how will we give you any? The first thing you do is you give it to someone else. A dollar is an employee. It'll make you a dime every year from here until this earth falls back into the gosh darn sun. Why would you give up all your employees? You don't need to own your own dental. I have all these guys say to me, well, I don't want to um, work for someone else. Well, really, who do you want to work for? Myself. Then he earns $100,000. What does he do with his real 100,000 employees? He gives them away Why he says he wants to work for himself. I say, well, would you rather work for someone else? My doc, my associates, the lowest one last year made $146,000. The highest one was 167000 They average right about 155000 I said, they, they earn 155000 They all max are 10401 k no management, they come in, lean to me, they don't do any management. The, the, they, when they go on vacation for one week, two weeks, I don't have to worry about any, any um, upset patients, whatever. The show goes on with or without them. Would you rather make $160,000 for me when the average just makes $122,000, take that $40,000 difference and shove it in a IRA, stocks, bonds, CDs, whatever, and they go, no, I'd, I'd rather work for myself, make 122000 And then if I, uh, after I bought all my liabilities and jet skis and mortgages and second and third divorce and all that, if I have a dollar left over, they'll buy an egg McMuffin, okay? If you want an employee to work for you, okay, the employee is every dollar you get. You hear that dental assistant? You hear that receptionist? You hear that hygienist? You hear that doctor spouse? Doctor spouse, let me tell you this. You tell me you love your husband. And you say, well, he's a workaholic and he's working himself to death and he must love what he's doing. He doesn't love what the hell he's doing. You're the one killing him. Every time he gives you $10,000, you go buy something. He doesn't know what to say because you're pretty and he loves you and you get all excited. And next, every time you get naked and make love, you buy something else. I mean, come on. If you love your husband, if you love yourself, if you love yourself, period, you will set aside a minimum of one dollar out of every ten minimum. I don't care what you gross, the government sells have food, but if you net ten dollars, if you can't stick one dollar of every ten you make in an asset that produces income every day till past your debt or whatever, you are seriously messed up. You're too susceptible to advertising, and you're falling into Gucci and all this crap like that. You need to take your television out of your house you're too susceptible to the TV. Get the television out of your house. The people in New York City are about a hundred times smarter. The people in New York City are apes. You're a, you must be a monkey without a tail because all they do is convince you into after a hard day's work to give them all their money so you gotta go back there next day. So if you wanna get richer, start buying income producing assets. This is how it looks. You have your job, you pay taxes, your rent, your food, you buy income producing assets, and it comes back in income, and someday it'll look like that. And the rich get richer and the poor get poor. So the cash flow pattern of an asset is right there. Money comes in, money goes out, and you take what's left, and it's minimum 10%. The average millionaire is 57 when they get there, and they average after they get their money and they pay out expenses, the average millionaire took 15% and threw it in, a, in an income producing asset. So studies show no matter what you make, you pay out your taxes, and whatever you net, 15% of it goes into savings, you'll be worth a million dollars. The poor and the middle class work for money, the rich have money work for them. So you know, either give all your employees away, every dollar bills an employee, work for money or have money work for you. Now in financial accounting, they talk about in the beginning here, 
that a change in assets equals a change in liabilities plus a change in contributed capital like getting a loan plus revenue minus expenses, your P&L statement, minus the dividends you pay out. Um, statement of income, the profit and loss statement, the P&L, takes the statements of cash flow and adds in non-cash items like depreciation, deferred taxes, what I call the double Ds. I don't know why I always remember the double Ds, but I can remember that. Was primarily designed for outside tax collectors such as the IRS, outside investors such as Wall Street, and regulators like SEC. It's great for outside tax collectors to use in taxing your company or outside investors to the investor and company or not, but it's not a very good report for inside management to use this feedback for decision making. I had more dentists looking at their P&L saying they made 20000 so they go out and spend 20000 and their check register is empty. You run out of cash because you don't watch your statement of cash flow, your check register, especially when you have your wife come in and do it or uh, things like that. We need someone committed. I hate accountants. Accountants keep you in the dark. Accountants remind me of the Catholic Church, 1000 AD, when the masses, when the priests faced the altar, they spoke in Latin. All the peasants knew German, Italian. They, no one knew what the hell they were saying. Finally, Martin Luther, a Catholic priest, went off with a cloistered Carmelite nun, just like my oldest sister's a cloistered Carmelite nun. The other one's a Macca Hard Mary nun. And he picked a cloister calling nun. They ran off. They had 10 kids and they started a Lutheran church. And the main focus was in getting the priests to face the people, quit speaking English. I mean, Latin, a dead language. You'd speak 5,200 words of Latin and Greek, start facing the peasants and start talking and understanding. You need to take control of your financial situation. You need to get rid of the accountant who all you do is gives you these reports, Latin and Greek. You don't know a damn thing that's going on. If your accountant tells you that you owe the government X dollars in 30 days and you don't have it, and you're paying him for advice? Look at your shitty situation. You're all stressed out because you owe the accountant, you owe the IRS $30,000, you got 30 days, you don't have a dime, yet you give this guy money every month? I mean, you're like a Democrat. I mean, look at your inner city. It's pathetic. Who led you there? Shoot that guy and go to somewhere else. And what do they do? They just keep running back to the leader who led them to misery. If you don't know what's going on, you get blindsided by owing the IRS a lot of money, and you have a 10-year relationship with an accountant, that's the reason you're an idiot. Fire the account, bring in a bookkeeper, and sit there and start doing this yourself. And you only need a part-time bookkeeper. Get someone to come in one day a week or two days a month or whatever. Get a chart of accounts. Um, here's today's dental chart of accounts. Uh, the, anybody can set up a chart of accounts. Uh, you know, break it up however you want to do it. I, I do my chart of accounts like the publicly traded dental companies do. Because these guys, you know, when General Dental and those guys go public, you know, these guys spend about a million dollars going public. It is a massive process. They've already thought all this stuff out. Pentagra, Monarch, Coast, um, all these dental companies. Get their charts of accounts. Get their 10Qs. Uh, figure out what's going on um, so you can start getting control of your financial accounting. And then here's, I'm just going through a chart of accounts, continue to add for me, for others, you know, depreciation, donations, dues, equipment, yada, yada, yada. Um, you've all seen these things a million times. It should be in your handout. The statement of income, otherwise known as the profit and loss, you know, um, this is the reason I don't like um, QuickBooks Pro or, or Quicken, because hell, on Quicken, you can't even go change uh, your top one, which is... Um, yeah, it's a variable cost. You, you can't change anything. They, they give you a stock deal and tell you that's the way to do it. With Peachtree Accounting, I can go up there on the expenses, and first I want my variable cost. Uh, put in dentist, um, hygienist, um, front office staff, paradental, and then I have my, uh, that's my variable cost. Then I have my uh, total labor cost subtotal, okay? Then I put in my lab, my supplies, and then I have another total um, for my variable cost subtotal. And total, total variable cost subtotal is usually about 65%. So don't sit there and do anything too crazy trying to utilize your fixed expenses more often than your variable costs. Because remember, in the service industry, fixed cost is only about 15% of the gain. Okay, fixed cost, your rent and or mortgage. Uh, actually, um, even if you own your dental office, it'd still be rent because you should own your dental office in a separate deal. Uh, I have a separate corporation that owns the real estate, so today's dental pays rent to that. you got to do this stuff for um, um, trust, for probate, for um, getting sued. Um, 
So today's dental rents, it rents from another corporation that I own that owns the gosh darn land and building. Uh, rents should be about, you know, um, you know, five, seven percent, whatever, advertising, depreciation, utilities, phone, continuing ed, miscellaneous. So you got your total fixed cost. So total variable cost, about 65 percent, includes the opportunity cost of the dentist getting paid. You know, if you own a restaurant, include paying the chef. Then you got your fixed cost, about another 15 percent, and then the thing nets about 20 percent. The statement of income, or the P&L statement, is basically your revenue, which is collections, deposits, minus refund, and then your expenses, which is your variable cost, dentist, hygienist, you know, front office staff, paradental, um, labor, uh, plus your uh, lab and supplies for your total, total variable cost, and then you got your fixed cost, rent, advertising, depreciation, utilities, phone, continue ed, miscellaneous for total fixed cost, and then you drop down to your net income. Okay, now your statement of cash flow, is a net change of cash. You put in deposits, you write checks. What's the net change? And then you can go back and look at that and say, what are your sources of use of cash? Some dentists will go in there and say, you know, I don't have any cash. I'm not problem. I don't know what's wrong. And I'll go back through the year and say, okay, but doctor, what are sources of cash that we use this year that we won't use next year? Are you remembering that you wrote $15,000 for an intro camera? Are you, imagining that, are you remembering that you bought $20,000 for an intro, uh, for a micro abrasion? Are you remembering you sit there and uh, paid a, uh, $4,000 and you went to uh, this institute or you paid $8,000 and went to this institute? Um, are you remembering these one-time uses of cash this year and um, that maybe you shouldn't have bought a $20,000 air abrasion machine? Maybe, and you bought it because you pay for everything in cash. You know, it's that Texas mentality where you just say something like that because it sounds good, but it doesn't make any sense. Uh, why, why did you pay $20,000 for a micro air abrasion machine that you're going to use for five years? Why didn't you lease it for $200 a month or $300 a month or $400 a month? Why did you not, why did you not lease intro cameras? And then you always come back with this stupid cockamamie stuff. Well, I went to this seminar and you, they said that you should never lease and never use credit. You should pay everything in cash. Yes, for consumption. But when you lease or borrow money for your business, that's called leverage. You know, the, you go to these seminars that say um, you should buy everything in cash, you should never borrow any money, uh, save up, buy everything in cash, yet the guy telling you to do that <coughs> didn't take his own advice for dental school. I say, well, none nuts. Why didn't you work at Taco Bell for 40 years, saving up for dental school? Why did you go take out a heel loan and student loans and guaranteed student loans? Why did you borrow money to go to dental school and then graduate $80,000 in student loans? And he goes, well, well, that's because it was for school. Yeah, that was an investment, okay? You wouldn't tell anybody to save up and pay for the school in cash. That's stupid, okay? You pay for cash in consumption. If your wife wants to buy a tenant score for $145,000 and you got it in cash and you want to flush all that money down the toilet, whatever. Maybe you'll get lucky and she'll get a little white mini skirt with no underwear. But when it's investment, when you want a microabrasion machine and it's $20,000 and you buy the thing in cash, and now it's a week later and you ran out of cash. But your P&L says you're profitable. Okay, do you see the difference here? There are, what are the sources of cash? You know, I like to, in my business, I like to lease the things for life of the deal. And I also don't like the way Patterson and Shine and these people try to give you five-year leases. Ray Kroc's a genius. He says that he used his stuff seven years. He goes into McDonald's, he opens up brand new for a, and he says, okay, the lease payment's going to be 3%. So 3%, what is this McDonald's going to collect? 3% that will be the lease payment. They put everything in the McDonald's they can buy for a 3% lease payment over seven years. I do not like three-year lease payments because then you're, you're paying too much cash, not enough uh, cash flow for three years. Then you're cash rich for four years. And then you get used to spending this cash rich. And then you can't go back and realize it's seven years and every McDonald's at the end of 84 months closes up, guts it, puts in all new stuff. So at any time you walk in one of McDonald's, 12,400 McDonald's in the United States, or 20,000 restaurants worldwide, you have a consistent clean product that's anywhere between one and 84 months old. So you tell Patterson and you tell Shine that you want to put in four operatories or four control cameras or an air abrasion machine or a Cirac 2 machine or something and you want to lease it for the life of this asset um, at least five years and for dental operatories and stuff at least seven and um, the check register is like a statement of cash flow the goal is to make a profit revenue which is your deposit shows where the money comes in expenses where it pays out shows where the money goes out 
The problem is that you're paying out money for something that you're going to use for seven years. It really screws up the flow. It's like when I run three miles, I like to run three miles probably every, every other morning. And if I go on a three mile run, you don't run out the driveway and do the hundred yard dash and pass out. You pace yourself with your cash flow for investment, lease, leverage. You know, every practice manager shall, even my very good friend, Greg Stanley, who we're, we love each other. Gentlemen can disagree. He says, pay for cash. And he says, save up, pay for cash. I say, well, you know, where I grew up, if you ask a millionaire, what's the easiest way to be a millionaire? You know what they always say? They say, borrow a million people of other, a million dollars of other people's money, buy an asset that pays the loan back in five years, and you got a million dollars. You want to be a billionaire? Okay, that's even easier. You borrow a billion dollars of other people's money, you buy an asset that pays the loan back over five years, now you're a billionaire. You teach people to go work at Taco Bell for $5 an hour, save up 50 cents an hour, and it takes you right up between 10 to 20,000 years to save up a billion. How do you have 20 billionaires, 200 billionaires in the United States alone, none of them saved their way? They borrowed other people's money, they bought an asset that paid it back, and now they're sitting on 200 billion. Usually they borrow the money in an IPO, initial public offering or whatever. So what I want you to do is I want you to spend cash. Greg Stanley, these guys are absolutely right for consumption. You know, buy your cars in cash. If you don't have the money to take a vacation in cash, don't do it. Cash, consumption at home. But for your business, it's investment, it's leverage. Remember the DuPont formula. Net income over sales is profit margin, that's P, times turnover. That's how many sales you get out of your same asset, that's turnover. But assets divided by what you control, divided by what you have into it, your equity, is your leverage. I would rather go out and borrow $96,000 for eight reveal intro cameras from Patterson that I'm going to use for seven years and make a lease payment once a month for 84 months than to not have it. And either this asset that you put in your office cash flows above your monthly payment or it doesn't. For instance, look at a panel machine. Patterson, Shine, Sullivan, all these places, they can put in a panel machine for maybe a hundred or two hundred dollar, I bought the state of the art plan method, all digital. Don't get the analog machine, get digital. I mean, if you're gonna get an x-ray, at least get one that's readable. You can put one of these in there for three hundred dollar a month payment. Okay, well, how much is your panel cost? Ninety dollars? So what do you have to do? Take three panels a month, you paid the lease payment. That means the fourth panel is gravy. But that fourth panel ninety-five dollars. Is that a return on an asset? Well, you, you didn't even buy the $20,000 asset. You had a $300, your equity was a $300 a month payment. So you're making basically $100 on other people's money, okay? So basically, uh, same thing in microabrasion. I go to your computer, you tell me you can't afford Patterson's KCP 1000 Whisper Air, state of the art $20,000 air abrasion, or Dense Dubai has one for about the same. The Creative Mach 5 has one for about the same. Uh, if you want to look at Creative Mach 5, uh, go to Expert at MTS Manji. He really likes that one. I like that one. Stu Rosenberg likes it. Kim Cooch. Or go to Miles Dense Dubai Air Midwest. That's a great one. I have that too. Or go to Patterson, the KCP 1000. You got that there. But I'll go in the office and Dennis tell me he can't afford it. I'll say, why can't he afford it? He goes, well, I don't have $20,000 in cash. I say, well, lease it. He goes, well, leasing, that's bad, and I'll have to be spanked and throw myself in a rose bush and flog myself. And I'll say, well, I'm on your management information system. I'm here on your software report, and I just got in your insurance billing report, and it says that you are billing out 10 sealants a month. Is that true or false? Paid for by an insurance company. Yeah, we, we do hell, and hell no, that was for a week. Howard, look, we do 20 sealants a month. I say, well, forget that. Let's just look at 10. You do 10 sealants a month paid for by a third person for $30 a piece. If those sealants would have done, been done with a sealant, they fail 10% a year, 30% are failed in three years, 50% are gone in half, five years, they all fail in 10 years because you're sealing, you're acid etching and bonding to pits and fissures filled with caca, okay? If you bought this machine, sprayed it out, nine in 10, go to the Denton, so a doctor alters enamel to Denton, restores it. Now in 10 years, we have less than 3% failure rate. You would have built it to the same third carrier as an occlusal composite. What would these people have paid for an occlusal composite? Instead of a $30 sealant that they already paid, it would have been a $90 occlusal composite or maybe been a $75 amalgam. Maybe they'll pay towards the amalgam fee. But the difference between the $30 sealant that a third person already paid last month and a $90 composite is $60. 
the state-of-the-art lease payment for the most nicest ones, the KCP 1000s, the Creative Mach 5s, is $480 a month. So seven of these upgraded, see, you've got the cash flow that seven of these upgraded paid for the lease payment. Now the eighth one, ninth one, tenth one's gravy, and you did 20. In fact, when a Pete Honest doesn't have a $20,000 Cadillac microabrasion, I mean, it's like they didn't even finish the sixth grade. So what's the balance? If we buy this, will we move closer to the goal to make net income profit from doing optimum oral health care? Well, that's your mission. Your mission is to make a profit from providing optimum oral health care dental services. Should we invest in a piece of dental equipment or should we buy in a mutual fund? That's your retained earnings to question, okay? Is a, is a dollar, I know if I put a dollar in an index fund, it's going to give me 12 cents. I will not put a dollar in my dental office unless it's going to give me 12 cents or more. That's your question. Would this money be better off in an index fund, in Berkshire Hathaway, in Intel stock? Uh, but be careful about Intel because Andy Grove has stepped back. Whenever the founding billionaire starts to leave, uh, I don't know, it gets scary. But gosh darn, Microsoft, he's still there. He's 40-something early. Michael Dell's still there. These are in high-growth industries. Would your dollar be better off in a dollar share of Microsoft or Dell Computers or Hewlett Packard or uh, an index fund or Berkshire Hathaway or would it actually have the highest return in your dental office? That's the question you need to find out. So then you get your statement of cash flow, the check register, and this has to be open information for the staff. The staff has to see the score. If you're going to sit there and say that General Dental, which is now merged with American Dental Partner, now Interdent, and Monarch Dentistry ran by um, um, a guy in Dallas who's a genius, or Coast Dental, or uh, Burner Dental, and if these guys are all public with their information so that their patients can see, um, you can see, your staff can see, the whole world can see, but you're not even going to let the people in your own office see. And by the way, you, you think if you let someone know, everybody's going to talk about you. I'll never forget when I was a little kid. I, um, um, whenever my dad would drop me off, I was taking in my 10-speed bicycle. And I said to my dad, uh, I was 10 years old. You know, he pulls up. He pops the trunk of his Lincoln. You know those Lincolns those days. The hood, would come, the trunk would come up. And hell, you could have a riding lawnmower in the trunk. There's a 10-speed. Hell, I could have been riding around in there. And he takes it out. And I said... I said, well, are you going to go in there with me? He goes, no, Howard, you're 10. you got to learn how to talk to people. I said, well, Dad, what should I tell him? And he'd always go ballistic. What do you mean, what are you going to tell him? What the hell did you tell me? Go in there and tell him you're a clim little hopper and you want your tennis racket restrung. Howard, if you can't talk to people, I'm not going to quit feeding you. How are you going to, you know, yada, yada, yada. And you sit there and you look at this, and I'll, and I'll never forget, it happened again a little while later. And I said, well, Dad, what, what should I tell my teacher? He said, Howard, come here. You know, you're, come, come here, sit on my lap. And I sat on his lap and he said, Howard, this morning, Five billion people on the earth got up. And guess what? None of them were thinking about you. No one's ever thought about you once. If you want anything, you have to talk to people. Why are you afraid of people? Why are you afraid that everybody's thinking about you? That is the most dysfunctional person I There are dental assistants, receptionists think that whenever two office members get together, they're talking about them. How many of your 5,000 patients got up this morning and while they're washing their armpits and washing their crotch or something, thinking, I wonder what my dentist is doing today. People don't think about other people. Everyone walks around following their own self-interest. This data has to be given to your staff. They're in the decision-making environment. They have to see the score. How they see the score, what you measure is what you can manage. What you measure is the score that they see, and the score that they see will change the way they make decisions, especially if there are incentives involved. So a tax loss, a tax loss carry forward is a tax credit. You know this stuff. What's the non-tax items on your P&L sheet? You know, the um, depreciation, deferred taxes. You know, it says you made 20000 but did someone write a check for $3,000 in depreciation? Uh, what's non-tax items? The discipline of mathematics is where science prevails quantitatively to the highest degree and where art is never used. The use of art in mathematics is completely unnecessary, but even more importantly, it is dangerous since you start believing in false numbers. Rule number one. All the practice management experts that I see out there, with the exception of maybe a handful, use fairy tale yardsticks. They pull measurements out of thin air. Watch the financial accounting standards verge. If your wife really, really, really wants to do the books, then I tell her this: this. You got the University of Phoenix, corporate wide free enterprise schools. You've got all these deals. Send her to gosh darn college. Have her take gosh darn financial accounting. Take out managerial accounting. She's got a four-year degree. 
Tell her, honey, bunny, if you really want to do the books in my office, you're going to commit to every Saturday for two years. Go back and get your MBA. Okay? Just commit. And by the way, whenever you get reports, the millionaires always assume the numbers are wrong. Okay? The numbers are to guide. You never look at a number and say, oh, that's the exact number. All numbers are wrong. You cannot ever get perfect information. All information is imperfect. Don't believe the numbers or you'll start having framing problems in your mind. The past does not equal the future. Just because you've hated financial accounting and you've hated running computer reports for 45 years, there are 60-year-old CEs who sat down and busted their butt and within a year mastered Microsoft Word, typed 90 minutes a, uh, an hour or a minute on typing, that now send email to all their staff. It is not cute to say that you graduated before the computer and that you're just old and ignorant, you don't like that. You have to learn, it's discipline. Climb the mountain, slay the dragons, reach success. Uh, know the DuPont formula. You should know this fact that you should have this. Your business should be summed up every year like this. You should see your, this is my net income over sales. Here's my sales over assets. Here's my leverage. You should have that every year minimum, every quarter minimum. I do it every month. Walmart, all Walmart stores are connect via satellite. You know how often they do their books? You know how often they close out all their books? Sam Walton, you know, that we do it monthly. He says, why do you do it in February? It's got 28 days. Four months have 30 days, seven months have 31 days. Walmart now closes out all their stores, all their businesses, see where they're sitting every hour on the hour. That's how often they get the score. Know your return on equity. Return on equity is the ultimate foundational yardstick. Billionaires got it to about 20%, kept it there for a decade. 20% is what you'll never do. Only 200 people have done it. Wall Street's giving you about 12%. CDs are giving you about three or four percent. You got to be, do not put a dollar into your dental office if you can't get 12 percent on it. In fact, there are dentists who got out of school, borrowed three hundred and fifty thousand dollars for a dental office, and now work their whole life just to pay that back. They'd have been better off getting three hundred fifty thousand dollars, putting in an index fund, or they came and got a job for me and made more than the average is. The average is makes 122,000 a year. Mine made between 145 to 165. If you get $350,000 loan, get the loan, stick it in the next fund, come work for me, do your 401k matching. I mean, keep your eye on the real score. The real score is not to do a root canal. The real score is to grow your money and get rich doing it. Uh, thank you for another fun day and I will see you tomorrow.